Welcome to today's Global Connections television program. I'm Bill Miller. Tens, if not hundreds of millions of children are living in very violent situations. What can be done to provide assistance to them and to reduce this violence? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. You're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. If you would like, we would encourage you to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of media outlet, be it a PBS station, community access television station, it could be an intra campus television hookup for a university, or if you just have a website and you're interested in these international issues, please go to the website for more information on how you can download the program free of charge. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service to help people better understand international issues and how they impact all of us, no matter where we live in the world. Today we're going to be looking at violence with children. And this is a prevalent problem worldwide. And my guest today is an expert on how we deal with this problem. My guest today is Ms. Jan Arno. Jan Arno is an internationally recognized authority on multicultural education, violence abatement, prejudice reduction, creativity, and leadership. Her latest book is In the Line of Fire, Raising Kids in a Violent World. Jan Arno, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. This well, is a major topic, a very interesting topic, and a very important topic. Let's just start off very at the very beginning. Why did you become interested in this particular topic? I've been working in this field of violence by and against children for more than 30 years. One of the things that people always say to me after a talk or whenever we at a book signing, uh, other than, gee, I need a drink, or, <laughs> oh, I had no idea, they ask me, uh, can I just tell them what to do? Just tell me what to do. I think they see the problem is so overwhelming and so big, they don't know where to step in. Mm. So I decided that I would, and I wrote this book, and there are over 400 things that people can do to abate violence. Exactly. We're going to get into them in just a moment. Uh, who was your intended readership? Did you intended, have certain groups in mind that yeah. you really wanted them to focus on this book? Yes. The book is divided into a child's life. So there's early childhood, then there's school years, and then there's the community. Mm -hmm. Anyone who touches the life of a child. And the basic thought, of course, is that we all touch children's lives, even if we ha don't have children of our own. So teachers, caregivers, parents, of course, grandparents, community leaders, the court system, all of them, counselors, school counselors, kids themselves. Exactly. Parents, law enforcement That's right. officers, That's everybody. Right. Anyone who is involved with children in any way, shape, or form, I think, would find this book to be of great interest I to them. I hope so. We, th we talk, talk about violence, and we think of violence, we think of that poor child we just saw the other day in Syria that whose house was bombed. We think of Iraq. We think of perhaps Yemen, where there's tremendous violence taking place, but really violence against children is not limited to one geographical area or certain countries. Oh, no. It? No. We have it in spades mm -hmm. in the United States. And when we see that young Syrian child or the one who was washed up on the shore trying to escape, that's what stays in our minds. What we don't mm -hmm. see are the children who are injured and killed every day on the streets of our country every day. In Chicago over the weekend there were several killings, several homicides. In Louisville there was a homicide. We just don't mm -hmm. see that on the news. We are desensitized at this point. 
We certainly are. Well, let's mention a few websites to make sure I don't forget them as we go through the program. Great. This is a very interesting book, In the Line of Fire, Raising Kids in a Violent World. And if our viewers would like more information, first off, they could contact you at your email address, jarno at iglou.com. That's right. And have direct contact with you. I would is, love that. That would even be better. And then you have a website. It's www.inpeacemaking.org. Mm -hmm which is in the process of being refurbished right now, but mm -hmm. still is there. And people can order the book off of that website if they would like. But they could also go to butlerbooks.com. Right. Or of course, they can always just Google it, go to Amazon, go to Amazon. whatever they'd like to do. <laughs> there are many ways to reach getting this book if, if they're interested in it. Right. Well, let's start off with your chapters. We try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, the first one dealt with the conditioning for hatred and violence. And in that chapter, you talked about the role of war toys, talking about advertising videos, violent videos, I guess television, role of television, news broadcasts. Uh, I, I talk a little bit about each of those and why each creates the environment, shall we say, for violence or the perhaps the perpetual, uh, the creation of violence. I've been in many, many homes where there are small children and there is a statistic that I can't pull off the top of my head right now, but something like 68 to 90 percent of all homes keep the TV on all the time, especially at dinner time what is on the television is not necessarily what's appropriate for children. Children as young as 18 months have been known to imitate what they see, both from their experience with adults, but also on television. They also can't discern, discern reality from fantasy. So, for example, on Sesame Street, they might think that Big Bird actually lives in the TV. I mean, that's a, a study that was done many, many years ago. So children are getting all of this violence from the news, from programming that's most appropriate for adults, from the computers, from the brothers and sisters video games, from all of that, and it's a, a barrage of mm -hmm. violence, as opposed to what I think probably what you and I grew up with was being outside more, mm -hmm. not being hooked into a through an umbilicus, you know, to some screen or other. Exactly. What uh, the video games, so many people have commented on how violent they are and they seem to be getting more violent. Uh, what do the studies show as far as how these help people in their own minds create a conditioning to accept violence, to really think this is the norm, this is what we need to be doing. I can go out here and blast somebody and right. <laughs> they'll come up in the next set or yeah. something like that. But what can be done with video games? Now, we'll never ban them, obviously, and we live in a democracy. It's hard to do that, right. if not impossible. But what can be, how debilitating are they? And what can be done to encourage producers to try to maybe change their format a bit? They're not going to change their format. They make money at they it. They make money <laughs> at it. That's the in reason. Fact, that's everything it. that's on television and in the movies that's violent, it's because they're making money mm -hmm. on this. And we even export our violence. You know, comedy doesn't translate. It's cultural, culturally specific, but violence doesn't need dialogue. And so we even export our violence. Over 3,000 studies have shown that there's a correlation between the viewing of violence mm -hmm. and violent behavior or aggressive behavior. And that's not even a question anymore. The question is, what do you do if your children go to someone else's home and their children are on video games all the time, or even in your own home. The first thing is that you have to really be careful and read the box that's, that's mm -hmm. with the video game that, that you have purchased or that you are renting. Many parents have no idea what their children are, are watching or playing. Another thing is to keep the computers out of the bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Put the computers in the family room or in the kitchen so that you always have an idea of what your child is watching and doing. And the uh, third thing that I always recommend to parents is that they play with their children. And as abhorrent as that may seem to many parents, it's important because then you can have a dialogue with your mm -hmm. child about what's going on and how unreal it is and how, wait a minute, there's no funeral for this person and you don't see the parents mourning this dead mm -hmm. person on the screen. And that brings in the whole issue of parents and teachers. Teachers play a tremendous role. Yeah, they and do. And the parents, obviously, how they need to be connected to this and be aware of this and also to work towards trying to 
help children understand these, what well, she mentioned, war toys, yes. the, the way programs are presented on TV, but they have a critical role to play, do they not? They do. I mean, even as early as, as daycare. I wouldn't put my child in a daycare center that allowed toy guns or other mm -hmm. toys of violence. It's fine if a child picks up a stick and plays war or plays cowboys and Indians with it. There's a difference between creative play and imitative play. And so many times in our child's lives, they are advertised and talked to about these specific toys that have their personalities intact. And you can't play with it unless you play with it this way. Even Forbes 500 companies now recognize that creativity is one of the top attributes they look for in a new hire. And children who grow up playing imitative games where they're not using their creativity are at a disadvantage at that point. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're talking about video games, but also children come into contact with books. They come into contact with other forms of communication. How do the issues of sexism and racism tie into what they're reading and how that may help create some type of condition in their minds to think it's okay to be a sexist or to be a racist or whatever the case right. might be, or be a bigot or a xenophobe or whatever the case might be. Yeah. So many books these days are not multicultural, meaning the characters are still white young boys or even white girls. But historically, girls have always been either victims or crones, witches, you know, uh, or princesses who are uh, unable to do things for themselves. They always have to be saved by men. So many of what, so much of what we see happening is that we're looking forward. So the weather forecast is looking forward and, and our futurists are looking forward. But we really have to look backwards to see where this came from. Where's the root of sexism? Where's the root of racism? And obviously, for a small child, because they're being read to from the arms of a caregiver, so it's all gospel truth, it's right there in the children's mm -hmm. literature. So again, parents have to be very careful about what they're reading to their children or letting them read. Mm -hmm. Another, we've tied right into this, to some degree, we're talking about girls, young girls, women, but we're also talking about the whole issue of gender equity. Right. And the fact that women in very few countries are on the same plane with men. There may be a few, perhaps the Scandinavian countries, but, but very, few is, uh, they're, very few. They're totally equal as far as uh, their compensation, their educational ability, uh, not their abilities, but opportunities. Just being shall we able say. to go to school. Be able to go to school, exactly right. But how does that, I know the UN has been very involved in mm -hmm. this. The UN, the old Millennium Development Goals, yep. the new Sustainable Development Goals, goal number five deals with gender equity. Mm -hmm. There are agencies at the UN, in fact, all agencies at the UN focus on women's programs right. to some degree. UN Women, UN Children's Fund, just on across because the board. Because they're so far behind. It, that's right, so many countries mm -hmm. around the world are so far behind. But how does that, uh, what can we do to promote that even more? I mean, there's a lot being done, but what can we do to help raise, to really raise that awareness and to provide more information to men so that they're aware <laughs> that women need to be equal. <laughs> and actually, through teaching, all teachers need to understand that there is a way to teach that will teach to both genders. Mm -hmm. So studies have shown, and you'll hear me say this over and over, the studies have shown, but they have shown that teachers teach more to males than they do to females because the boys are the ones who are active. You know, they're the ones who are raising their hands and they're the ones who have more energy, generally speaking, than the girls who have been already trained to be more demure and mm -hmm. to sit back. In early grades, all of the learning is done collaboratively. So you see groups of kids learning together. But as they, as they age out of middle school and grade school, they end up learning on their own. There's no more collaborative learning. And that benefits the boys. The collaborative learning benefits the girls, but single learning benefits the boys. And that's where we lose our girls to the STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. So if we really want our, our girls to get ahead and to understand that STEM courses are for them, we need to institute more collaborative learning 
and we need to reach out specifically to girls who show an interest but don't know how to go about it. We're talking about these issues, a lot of what we're referencing we're talking about in the United States. Yes. But this is worldwide. The, Absolutely. What we're talking about today, you can take right. it to any country in the world and you're yes. going to we have, don't have a corner. same situation. Yeah, we, we don't have a corner on the violence <laughs> or the discrimination. Right. No, we don't. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no. A lot can be said for that. We want to reduce it here and elsewhere too. That's right. Another issue or several issues that come up that are so prevalent today that we've always had bullying to some degree, yeah. obviously. When you taunt people, you make fun of people, you put them down, that type of thing. But today, it seems it's gone to a higher level. You got not only bullying, but you also have cyber bullying. You have other problems like with the sexting, mm -hmm. uh, not texting, but sexting, sexting that's going on. How do you deal with these? How do you, what do you advise people to do as far as bullying, cyber bullying, and sexting? That's a huge topic. Again, parents have to be in the lives of their children. They don't have to be helicopter parents, meaning hovering above all the time, but they do have to be knowing, for example, who their friends are, how they're doing in school, what's going on in their lives, and again, not having that computer in the child's room. There's a new word in our lexicon called bully side, and that is suicide through bullying. Many children, hundreds of children have taken their lives because they've been bullied and not been able to talk to their parents about it. Some of it has happened through cyberbullying, which is even worse than bullying on the playground because frequently you don't even know who your attacker is. And there's also physical, relational, uh, and cyberbullying, so there's all different kinds of bullying. Sexting is a whole nother issue. Sexting is where one person will send, usually on a cell phone, a picture of them that is inappropriate, naked, you know, body parts, whatever. This is prevalent a lot in our high schools. And what kids don't understand is that these are felonies. That, for example, if a girl takes a picture of her breasts, let's say, and texts it to a boy, and he finds it funny, which has happened many times, and spreads it around to his friends, and then it goes viral, she, even though the pictures are of her, can be charged with three felonies. One is possession, one is distribution of pornography, and the other is promoting pornography. Mm -hmm. Three felonies. <laughs> he who passed it on also could be charged for three felonies. If they are convicted, these kids have to go on a sex register. And good luck applying for college. Mm -hmm. Not to mention what it costs in legal fees, etc. And I'm not even talking about the moral aspects of it. So it's something that parents have to be absolutely vigilant about and have a conversation, mm -hmm. not a monologue, but a dialogue with their children. And of course, dialoguing starts way, way, way early. Mm -hmm. You can't start dialoguing with your children in high school if you haven't done it prior to that. Mm -hmm. Now, one way people can have this checklist of what we're talking about today, and we're just barely scratching just barely. the surface. I mean, there's so much, and this really is an excellent book, In the Line of Fire, and you have so many checklists in here of the items we're talking about, and what you can do. You can check yes. off how to interact with your children, how to deal with the teachers, how to, uh, whatever, talk to them about bullying, cyber bullying, and mm -hmm. that is so critical to focus on this and to try to learn more about this and to do it and to get involved. You got to get involved with your children. There are so many other areas too. One thing we were talking about, the war toys. But yes. we see too the proliferation of guns. Mm -hmm. It used to be that guns were, you know, people would have them in the back of their pickup trucks or whatever, <laughs> hanging at home or something like that, using for hunting. But handguns are becoming so pro prominent and so prolific out there. Did we find that guns are getting into the schools, into the high schools, middle school, maybe even grade school, as you read about mm -hmm. a child that may take a gun from home and kill a student by accident. How prevalent is that, and what can we do about that as far as trying to reduce the flow of guns, especially to children, of all people? I mean, right. you know, adults, responsible adults can handle guns, and hopefully, right. <laughs> in some cases they can't. But what can you do as far as trying to keep them out of students' hands, and especially out of gang members' hands? You know, guns are everywhere. I could go right now to various neighborhoods in Louisville, for example, and 
they would ask me what kind, how fast do you want it, how much do you want to pay. You know, I could get my hands on a gun in 15 minutes in almost any place I go. So they're everywhere. That's number one. Number two, I'm not advocating people having to give up their guns. What I talk about in the book is that there are way too many children being killed by guns. There were more babies and toddlers killed by guns than all of uh, armed uh, law enforcement officers in three different years that uh, are listed in the book. I mean, there it's it's horrible. So the first thing is, if you have a gun in your home, you must keep it locked up. And you must keep your ammunition locked in a separate place from your gun. The second thing is, if you think your child needs mental health care, it's your responsibility to get that for the child, even against their wishes. We've seen so many kids who were bullied, who did not talk to their parents, who perhaps were bipolar, we don't know. But if those ch children had had the mental health care that they needed, perhaps those school shootings wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Another thing is to lobby Congress. Congress hasn't done anything since mm -hmm. Obama mm -hmm. took office to change the ban on assault rifles. In other words, to implement it. So many of the guns that we see on the streets and in these mass shootings are assault weapons. And these are not weapons that you go and use for deer hunting or no. goose hunting or whatever the case, no. duck hunting or whatever the case might be. No, they're they not. They have a totally different purpose. They do. Totally, they do. They totally. don't belong in our streets. Exactly. They don't belong in our hands. Yes. Now, if we could, we're about to run out of time, unfortunately. We just, <laughs> again, just started, just started on this. Uh, you were involved in a five-year program to develop a leadership coalition confidence building right. activity with the Congo, Burundi, I think Rwanda. Rwanda. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what was the bottom line of that as far as what was it to accomplish? The bottom line is that I was asked. I never go mm -hmm. anywhere I'm not asked. I never go into a country and say I'm an American and I can fix you. I find out what people need and then design programs, training programs, to help build their capacity. In this case, someone from Rwanda came to me and said the genocide was tribal. No one trusts each other. We need you to help us establish an interfaith coalition so that people can see that there are barriers that we can pull down across traditions, across tribes, and across religions. Mm -hmm. And it's turned into a 10-year program. They are now taking my materials. I'm writing the manuals for them. They are translating them into their own languages, and they're taking them and training others now. Mm -hmm. So it's been very, very successful. I'll be going back next year again. Mm -hmm. And again, our viewers can contact you and get more information Absolutely. on this. You, several years ago, you also addressed the United Nations General Assembly, which yes. is no small feat. <laughs> Not many people get to address the UN General Assembly. What was your main message to the, however member, many members there were at that time, there are 193 member states today, but what was your main message to the members of the United Nations General Assembly? The message, and I actually, if, if anybody wants to read that speech, I have it and can send it to them, but the message was to their children it was to their children through them that they have to take up the mantle of equality and that they have to be the ones to say to their leaders, no, stop, you're not doing right. You're not doing well enough on our behalf. And not to stop lobbying because it's the children themselves who are the voices that will carry through their leaders. Jan, what would be your main message at this point to our viewers as to what they can do to focus on, first, to become aware of this problem, mm -hmm. but secondly, to get involved with their children and to help reduce violent situations, violent conditions for children in their immediate family and perhaps in surrounding mm -hmm. families in the neighborhood and in the community? The first thing to understand is that there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that it's a huge problem. The good news is that it's not really one problem, it's a set of problems. And there is a place for everyone to jump in, depending on what level they wish to jump in and where their children are in that, in that spectrum. And there are so many things they could do. Nobody has to do everything, but everybody really needs to do something. 
Exactly. That's the, the bottom line is we bottom do. Line. And again, this is a wonderful book in the line of fire, raising kids in a violent world. And there are really some tremendous suggestions in here. Thank and, you. and the best part, I think, for me anyway, would be the checklist of how you can focus on each of these issue areas, whatever we're talking about, cyberbullying, uh, sexting, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. and go through this checklist as to what you can do to help reduce this problem. But Jan Arno, I want to thank you so very much for thank a you, very Bill. interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.